Good afternoon. Our first item of business is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Finlay Carson. Ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the funding for community sentences. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of ensuring criminal justice services have the resources they need and funding for community justice services across Scotland remains at record levels. We've allocated around £100 million of funding to local authorities who work with a range of organisations and partners to help deliver community sentences, support the rehabilitation of people with convictions and reduce reoffending. This includes an extra £4 million investment in community sentences, which was introduced in 2016-17 and was continued in 2017-18, helping to support local authorities to deliver robust community sentences. The Government is committed to supporting local authorities in delivering robust community sentences. The new funding distribution model for allocating criminal justice social work funding introduced in 2017-18 allows each local authority working in partnership with statutory partners and the third sector, the flexibility ta to target resources to better meet local priorities and needs, which includes community sentences. And we'll continue to work with partners to ensure that robust community sentences continue to be delivered. Finley Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Research by the Scottish Conservatives has revealed that hundreds of community payback order work has taken months after sentence to actually begin some taking over a year. These delays have progressive, progressively worsened over the last three years. Can the Cabinet Secretary commit to ending these delays and ten, tell the Chamber how he intends to do it? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, officer. Um, the details which the Member makes reference to uh, don't put the, the issue of community sentencing in any context. The reality is that in the year 15 to 2016 uh, is that there were around uh, 19,500 uh, community sentences issued. Uh, of that, there was a delay in around 6% of the overall community sentences being taken forward within the timescale that's required. Local authorities are responsible for ensuring that they comply with the timeframes which are set around uh, community sentences and the way in which they are uh, delivered. We are presently uh, reviewing the existing uh, guidance for uh, breaches of community sentences to make sure that that is robust and it's very clear about what sanctions should be put in place. Uh, where there are any breaches of community sentences. But as I've also set out my answer, President Officer, the record funding which we are providing to local authorities is exactly that, to help to support them in delivering robust, effective community sentences right across local authorities in Scotland. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the funding for criminal justice social work services, which includes the delivery of community sentences, will continue to be ring-fenced? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, we recognise the importance of community justice social work funding to make sure that we have effective delivery of community sentencing options and programmes. And that's why we have ring-fenced that particular funding to local authorities and we have no intentions to change the existing arrangements. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary told me in the Chamber that the funding formula for the allocation of resources has already been published. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain to the Chamber when and where that formula was published? The information I have is that while the formula has been shared with the sector, it has not been placed in the public domain. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that the formula is published and deposited in SPICE? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, if it would help the Member, I'm more than happy to send a copy of the formula directly uh, to her following uh, question time. Uh, but what I want to reassure the member, because it would appear to be implied within our question that this is some form of formula which has been imposed by government. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the formula which has been introduced is one which was agreed by COSLA and was approved by the COSLA leadership group. This is not something which has been forced on local authorities by uh, the Scottish government. What it is is about making sure that it's a process that puts in place the distribution of funding to criminal justice social work teams that's reflective of the demands which their services receive. And that's exactly why we've taken it forward in a co-production basis, working with local authorities to achieve that. So I want to just reassure the member and any members in the chamber uh, that this is not a distribution model which has been imposed by government. It's one which has actually been taken forward in partnership with local authorities and was supported by COSLA and the COSLA leadership group. 
but I'm sure that a member, a copy of the formula, is sent on to the member for her information. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President. Officer, the Cabinet Secretary recalled from our exchanges last week that um, the welcome extension of the presumption uh, against short prison sentences does rely uh, on proper funding of the community-based measures he alludes to. Does he accept that delivery of such measures in rural and particularly island areas is um, of necessity going to be uh, more costly? And therefore, will he uh, assure the, uh, the Chamber that the funding distribution model he refers to will take proper account of this and the need to, 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 to fund fund small proportionate island-based services uh, on a year-on-year ring-fenced basis is adequate so that those services can be maintained. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, as I uh, mentioned earlier on, we are providing record levels of funding for community sentencing programme and we've increased that over the last couple of years to support local authorities in developing new programmes uh, uh, going forward and we're considering how we can continue to support them in this area uh, in the years ahead. What I can say to the member is that the actual uh, funding model uh, does have a particular uh, rurality uh, waiting within it in order to recognise some of the specific challenges that our more rural uh, communities and rural local authorities have in being able to deliver these particular programmes. And that's why some of the redistribution which is taking place around that resource is to help to support uh, those, specific, uh, those specific local authorities. And what I also want to assure the member is that, again, in, in taking this forward, we've carried out the redistribution model in a way that is uh, developing it in partnership with local authorities. But alongside that, we've also capped any changes uh, in uh, a reduction funding for any given local authority uh, and capped that over a five-year period in order to make sure that no local authority is put at a disadvantage as a result of uh, the redistribution. But I uh, can assure the member that the, the new distribution model has a rural uh, waiting within it to recognise some of the specific challenges that can be faced by our rural local authorities. And question number two, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to support community policing during the current parliamentary session. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Government is committed to supporting our police service. Uh, that is why we are protecting the police resource budget in real terms in every year of the current Parliament and have committed £61 million of reform funding in this financial year to support transformation of the service. The Scottish Government's strategic policing priorities, which were laid before this Parliament last October, seek to further strengthen the focus on community policing and inclusion. They underline our expectation that local communities' needs are understood and reflected in the planning and delivery of policing, and that our police service is accessible and responsive to the needs of all people in Scotland. This focus is reflected in Policing 2026, Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority's 10-year strategy, which seeks to develop local approaches to policing in partnership with communities across the country. Colin Beatty. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Tories' outrageous rules, which leave Police Scotland the only territorial police service in the UK, having to pay millions of pounds in VAT, which cannot be reclaimed, needs to end, just as the Tories managed to do for the Highways England and Academy schools, and this in order to ensure Police Scotland can provide the best service possible? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, officer, I completely agree with the member. Uh, police Scotland are the only territorial police force in the UK uh, that is not able to reclaim that, as is the case for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And when it has suited the Conservative Government at Westminster, they have changed the VAT rules in order to suit those particular organisations. So, for example, uh, they changed the rules in order to suit uh, Highways England when it was turned into a national organisation and also for a number of non-departmental public bodies. When it suited the UK Treasury to change the VAT rules, they have sought to change the VAT rules in order to allow them to reclaim VAT. Then, officer, the UK Government are disadvantaging our fire service and our police service here in Scotland by the discriminatory way in which they are going about continuing to prevent Police Scotland and the Fire and Rescue Service from being able to reclaim VAT. That could cost the Scottish public purse some £280 million by the end of this Parliament alone. £200 million for our police service, £80 million for our fire service. It's about time the Scottish Conservatives started standing up for our police officers and firefighters in Scotland, because that's money that should be going into our police and fire service, not into the pockets of the Treasury. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In light of reports this week headlined, IT system threatens safety of Police Scotland staff, 
What support are the Scottish Government giving Police Scotland to improve their IT system and ensure that there is an integrated network allowing safe delivery of community policing? Uh, the short answer, President Officer, is that the member shouldn't believe everything he reads in the Daily Mail. Uh, as he will be aware, uh, the issue of taking forward the IT system within Police Scotland is a matter for Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. But that's why we're also providing them with an additional £61 million of reform funding this year in order to help to support them in making investment into key areas that can support the service. I do hope, though, the member will stand up for Police Scotland and allow them to be able to reclaim the VAT so they can use that money to invest it in frontline policing services, including their ITC system. I'm Claire Baker. And thank you, President Officer. I've been raising the issue of the illegal use of quad bikes and off-road bikes um, for a number of years in public parks and public paths in Fife. And I would like to recognise the proactive response we've had from the community police in tackling this problem. It has been supported by the excellent work of Kingdom Off-Road Motorcycle Club, who can help achieve behavioural change in this area. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give that such collaborative working can be delivered with the community police throughout Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the member raises what I believe is a very good example of the collaborative way in which Police Scotland, particularly at a local level, are working with a range of partners to tackle these types of unacceptable behaviour. That was one of the key areas that we set out in new strategic policing priorities, was to make sure there was a greater focus on inclusive and proactive local uh, work through the police service. That work has been taken forward largely at a national level by DCC uh, Fitzpatrick, who has made it very clear that working in partnership with a range of agencies at a local level to tackle these types of issues are absolutely key to helping to prevent them. But it's not only taking a law enforcement approach to deal with these issues, it's about looking at how you can work with other partners in the local community that can help to support young people who may be engaging in this type of unacceptable behaviour to get into a more productive way in which they can actually participate in what they want to do, but it's not causing a disruption or a risk to the rest of the local uh, community. And that's exactly the type of work that Police Scotland take forward, quite frankly, on a day in, day out basis. Uh, because the level of policing and the standard of policing which we receive in Scotland is of a very high standard. Uh, and I would like to reassure the member that's exactly the type of approach that Police Scotland are determined to make sure they continue to take where right across the country as and when it's appropriate. Question number three, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the use of mosquito devices to deter the gathering of young people. Minister Annabelle Ewing. The Scottish Government is opposed to the use of mosquito anti-loitering devices. We do not believe their use is consistent with our approach to tackling antisocial behaviour. And note the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has expressed concerns over their use and children's right to freedom of movement and peaceful assembly. I Sandra thank the White. Minister for that re reply and uh, obviously we are aware the Scottish Government is aware of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to prohibit the use in public spaces of acoustic devices used to disperse gatherings of young people and in brackets so-called mosquito devices. Uh, can I therefore ask what measures the Scottish Government is taking in regards in light of the UN conclusions? Minister. Uh, I, I thank the, the member for her, her supplementary question and um, I have actually been taking a number of actions in this regard. I have written to uh, all local authorities uh, and indeed other public bodies such as Transport Scotland, Police Scotland and COSLA to emphasise the government's opposition to the use of mosquito devices and I've asked for information as to their policies on mosquito devices and I wait uh, their uh, uh, replies. Uh, I, I am uh, not unsympathetic to those who would take the view that we should look to an outright ban on mosquito devices, but I would say, presiding officer, at the present time, there are simply no reliable figures on how widespread or otherwise the use of mosquito devices is in Scotland, and to proceed successfully down a legislative route, we would, of course, need to show that any legislation is uh, justified as a proportionate uh, uh, response. Uh, but we will continue to... to, uh, to work uh, in this area and to ingather all information available to us. Question for Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent comments by the Lord Advocate, what role community payback and direct reparation with the victims of crime will play in its future plans for the justice system? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, paying back to the community is at the heart of our approach. Community payback orders deliver real benefits for their communities. Over 1.8 million hours of unpaid work were imposed on offenders as part of their CPOs in 2015-16. In addition, 
Prosecutors have the option of imposing direct measures such as financial penalties, including compensation to victims and unpaid work. This approach is in line with our national strategy for community justice, which sets out our commitment to shifting criminal justice interventions upstream using the least intrusive intervention at the earliest point. Our vision and priorities for justice in Scotland laid out this government's intention to adopt a more progressive, evidence-based approach designed to prevent and reduce further offending and underpinning our determination to ensure that we live in safe, cohesive and resilient communities. Claire Adamson. I recently attended the APEX lecture by the Lord Advocate and witnessed the positive reaction in the room to the presumption against custodial sentences up to 12 months. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the Lord Advocate when he says prosecutors and courts looked for decisions which were appropriate and proportionate and that was not the same thing as soft touch? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I, I do recognise that since we've announced our decision to uh, seek Parliament's agreement to increase the presumption of short sentences to 12 months is that there has been a wide range of support from right across the criminal justice sector to the approach which we're taking one which is founded on making sure uh, that we don't get ourselves caught up in the false dichotomy of what is tough and what is soft justice, but we make sure we take an approach which is informed by smart justice and an approach which is based on evidence that we know is much more effective in addressing an offending an offender's behaviour and underlying causes which can drive an, offender, an offender's behaviour. So on that note, I do very much agree with the Lord Advocate uh, that a proportionate uh, approach uh, which is appropriate in the circumstances is about dealing with these issues effectively. What I can also say, President Officer, that the whole issue of sentencing, even with a change in the presumption, is precisely that. It is a presumption. Uh, the option for the court to impose other measures, including a custodial sentence, will remain in the hands of sentencers, uh, and they will continue to have the discretion to pass what they see as being the most appropriate sentence. But I can assure the member is that we are determined to make sure that we use an approach which is informed by evidence that can help to deliver safer communities by reducing the risk of individuals committing offences again in the future. And that's was informing the approach we're taking around the presumption against short sentences. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken by the police to deal with antisocial behaviour at Helensburgh Central train station. Minister Annabel Ewing. Police Scotland has been involved in a number of multi-agency meetings with partners, including British Transport Police, Children and Family Social Work Departments and uh, the rail unions to deal with the antisocial behaviour at Helensborough Central train station. Police Scotland has applied a combination of prevention, education and enforcement measures, including instigating additional high visibility officer patrols of all train stations in the area and deploying trained youth engagement officers in an effort to engage with the young people involved and to positively influence their behaviour. Where acts of disorder or antisocial behaviour have amounted to contraventions of criminal mm. law, Police Scotland have taken appropriate enforcement actions against the persons involved. Jackie Bailey. I'm sure the Minister would want to join with me in thanking all the agencies involved in tackling the antisocial behaviour and equally join with me in condemning the abuse of railway staff who have been verbally and physically assaulted, as have passengers too. Will she therefore commit today to reviewing the Emergency Workers Scotland Act of 2005 to ensure that transport workers are now covered within the terms of that legislation? Minister. Um, I, I do join with Jackie Bailey in, in indeed thanking all the agencies. It is clear to me that there has been a, a really tremendous effort put in uh, by everyone and, and I commend all of their actions and I do condemn any abuse of rail workers or anybody else. Um, I would say to the member uh, as regards the, the question about uh, extending the Emergency Workers Act of 2005 that I am aware that the member has written to the Minister for Transport, Mr Hamza Youssef, about the matter. I understand that Mr Youssef is in the process of replying to the member and that he will say that he has asked his officials in Transport Scotland to review the practicalities of including uh, rail workers under this legislation. I also understand that Mr Youssef is meeting with the RMT shortly and is hoping also to meet with the member to discuss uh, these important matters further. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take on sentencing and stronger controls in the sale of corrosive chemicals to tackle the use of acid as a weapon. Minister. Uh, our criminal laws are clear in that anyone using corrosive substances to attack another person can be convicted of assault and receive up to life imprisonment. Sentencing in any given case is, of course, a matter 
uh, for the court. Scottish government officials have discussed with UK government officials the steps being proposed in this area following the UK government's announcement in July of an action plan to tackle uh, the use of acid or other corrosive uh, corrosives and violent uh, attacks. That dialogue will continue, including to assess what steps may be required in respect of retailers and how they sell corrosive substances, including age limits on the sale of such substances. Ian Gray. The Minister will be aware of the case of my constituent, uh, Molly Young, who was attacked uh, in school by a fellow pupil using acid. This crime was carried out using drain cleaner bought freely online. The product was, in essence, a powerful concentration of sulfuric acid. Indeed, the sale of some corrosive substances is regulated, but not this one. Uh, does the Minister agree that cannot be right? Uh, and what, beyond these discussions, will she do to correct the situation? I'm not sure this case is sub judice, but the Minister is slightly careful. Um, well, I, I am aware of, of the, the case that the, the member has raised. Indeed, he has raised that in correspondence. Uh, and I would say in general terms uh, that the, the fact that we are engaged in dialogue with the UK government on this matter is very important because, of course, uh, for many, uh, for certain at least of these areas, uh, there may be questions as to the legislative competence of this parliament uh, to deal. And even if that were not the case, it may also be considered, particularly as far as, for example, online uh, sales are concerned, that it may be better to adopt a consistent approach uh, across the, the nations of the, of the UK so as we can ensure uh, that we do avoid any uh, potential loopholes being taken advantage of. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn now to culture, tourism and external affairs questions. And we'll start with question number one from Andy Whiteman. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the financial arrangements governing the management and maintenance of the Palace of Holyrood House are fair and equitable in terms of public funding. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, as the member is aware from answers to written questions, there is a long-standing memorandum of understanding dating from 2000, which governs the management and maintenance of the palace and which is now due for review. The financial arrangements will be considered during this review by all parties to the memorandum. Andy Whiteman. Uh, last year, Historic Environment Scotland incurred £890,000 in staffing costs, partly to reimburse the Royal Household for staff employed by the Royal Household. Can the Cabinet explain why funds voted by this Parliament are used to pay for members of staff employed by the Royal Household? Last year, also, the Royal Collection Trust received all of the £4.2 million in income from visitor charges. Given that this income was historically apportioned between the Secretary of State for Scotland on the one hand and the Royal Household on the other, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why her department is now spending public funds on the palace while receiving none of the visitor income it historically kept offset the expenditure and why these financial matters are not covered in the Memorandum of Understanding? Well, I think it's appropriate that the memorandum is reviewed now. We have Historic Environment Scotland, a new agency, a new NDBB uh, responsible. Um, in terms of the route of financing, uh, the responsibility for providing uh, the official residence of the, of the sovereign in terms of the, the maintenance of that, that is a responsibility of ministers, and HES carries that on our, our behalf. In terms of the income that's generated by Holyrood Palace, um, that, as is, has been the case for many years, uh, is, is the, the surplus to the income from the Crown Estate is then provided back to the UK Treasury and the costs are then reimbursed to Scotland via the Scottish Bloc. Now that is maybe not as transparent as he or I may like but that is the current situation that has been for a number of years as regards staffing. Um, staffing is primarily for uh, industrial staff and stonemasons, joiners, plumbers, electricians. Uh, there may be instances in relation to security, you'll understand I might not want to, to, to go that into that in detail, but all these are subjects which I'm sure the Chief Executive of um, Historic Environment Scotland can discuss with the member. I understand uh, there is a meeting arranged for the 25th of September and these issues can be explored further with the appropriate organisation. Neil Findlay. Um, in relation to uh, Holyrood Palace and other issues relating to the royal family, why is it that the Scottish Government has gone way beyond what the Information Commissioner suggests is appropriate in relation to freedom of information requests, uh, how they are handled uh, and how information is provided to the public? I'm not really sure that's a question. No. It's, it's not really uh, a supplementary and a question about Palace of Holyrood House. Question, point of order? because it relates to issues around Holyrood House 
or any other policies or any other issues relating to the royal family? I don't doubt it's important, and uh, the comments you made are on the record. However, it's not a supplementary question. Question number two, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it can support people to repatriate the bodies of family members who have died abroad. Uh, Minister Alistair Allen. As consular assistance, including advice to bereaved families who wish to repatriate their loved ones from abroad, is reserved to the UK Government, the Scottish Government would ordinarily refer individuals to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office so that they can be put in touch with the Consular Affairs Department. The Consular Affairs uh, Department would then advise on matters of repatriation. The Scottish Government are unable to offer any repatriation services above and beyond those offered through the Consular Affairs team, uh, with this being a reserve policy area. Um, consular assistance uh, being provided at a UK level through local embassies and consulates. Following repatriation, however, several organisations within Scotland are equipped to provide bereavement support for individuals, uh, in addition to the work of community support groups. Bob Doris. My answer, Minister, my constituent Julia Love and myself recently met with Colin Bell, who, following the tragic death of his son, established the Kevin Bell Repatriation Trust in Ireland, the Trust pays the repatriation costs for all those from Ireland who die overseas using a global network of fundraising groups. Can I ask the Minister to meet myself and Julie, whose own son tragically died overseas, to discuss how a similar initiative could be supported in Scotland? And, Presiding Officer, I'm also delighted to see that Colin Bell has agreed to attend any such meeting if secured. Minister. Well, I, I am, of course, uh, very willing uh, to meet uh, the member and his uh, constituents uh, about this very sad matter. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office provide uh, a notification of the death and then outline the opportunities uh, for bereaved individuals to have access to support. But I'm aware that charities such as Death Abroad, You're Not Alone, uh, provide valuable support to those who have lost loved ones abroad. And I'm aware of charities elsewhere, uh, including, I believe, Ireland, such as the Kevin Bell uh, uh, Repatriation Trust, which, in addition to to the above work uh, also support uh, repatriation costs. And uh, if such an organisation were to establish itself uh, within Scotland, I'm sure uh, this would be very welcomed uh, in uh, communities across the country. But I re reiterate, I'm very, uh, w very uh, willing to meet with the uh, member and his constituents. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Pres Presiding Officer. To ask what the Scottish Government has done to cooperate with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to ensure the safety of Scots caught up in hurricanes Irma and Maria. Well, I'm not entirely sure that, that is quite. Uh, this is a body. This is about repatriating bodies of family members. Again, I think uh, it's not entirely supplementary. Question number three, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what efforts it is making to support the winter tourism industry. Cameron Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting the winter tourism industry in Scotland. In the last five years, the Scottish Government has allocated nearly £11.5 million to the development of winter tourism. In addition to Scottish Government's financial support, our enterprise agencies, uh, High Scottish Enterprise, provide business advice to and account manage a number of enterprises that operate in the winter tourism sector. And Visit Scott has been working with the winter tourism sector to extend the tourism season and encourage visitors to travel to Scotland during the winter months. Thank the Cabinet Burnett. Secretary for that answer. Um, in the news this week, we have seen reports that the longest lasting patch of snow in Scotland, known as the Sphinx, is about to melt away from the Highland hillside for the first time in more than a decade. Now, although beyond the control of the Scottish Government, can I ask if it will be bringing in place specific support measures for the winter tourism industry for when snowfall levels are poor? Thank you. I would also note that the member has notified uh, the Chamber of his register of interest here. Cabinet okay. Secretary. Uh, thank you. I, I also saw that uh, and was, it is concerning as obviously the, the climate change impacts can have uh, effects on a number of areas. Obviously, uh, there's been variability in the level of snow over recent years. And so, therefore, looking at diversification is important, and that is part of the engagement as well. I also would say that uh, for the first time, for the first year, uh, Visit Scotland has worked with a North American uh, travel uh, agencies in particular to bring forward um, uh, tourism uh, and visits, uh, encouraging people to come at different times of the year. But clearly, um, the variations in terms of uh, what can be done in relation to artificial snow is a matter for the for the industry. But you know, I am uh, enthusiastic that we can continue our winter sports. Uh, unfortunately, snow is a 
and whether it is reserved. I can't take account of that. But I do think that there has to be active responsibility for what we can do in terms of diversification and, old, and indeed the work that Visit Scotland is carrying out to encourage, particularly from the North American uh, vi visitors, uh, uh, opportunities to come and encouragement to come, not just in the summer months, but in the winter months as well. Lewis MacDonald. And despite the uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary's view that the weather is reserved, uh, will she, will she uh, accept that there are opportunities for diversification, both in promoting alternative uh, outdoor activities in areas which have a strong existing offer in terms of winter sports, but also in terms of promoting city breaks? She may have seen today that both Edinburgh and Aberdeen featured among the top 10 city breaks uh, uh, identified by laterooms.com in a survey published today uh, and will she tell us what more can be done to promote city breaks in Scotland during the winter months uh, in the years ahead? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly City Breaks a great opportunity for Scotland, and that's why some of the support for the winter festivals in particular um, has embraced not just Edinburgh, but uh, other cities um, elsewhere, and extending the season and looking at what we can do from St Andrew's Day right through to um, Burns Night as well. And in terms of what we can try and do with active sports that are not necessarily snow-related, uh, I visited the Seven Stains down in the south of Scotland looking at some of the mountain, mountain biking opportunities, and clearly in terms of the attractions of Scotland you know we have just been voted the most beautiful country in the world by rough guide voters and our country is not just beautiful in the summer but all year round and the sheer drama of some of um, our locations particularly during the more um, you know I suppose the the win winter period it uh, can also be uh, promoted uh, particularly for many visitors who come because we don't have all year sun and they're trying to get away from what can be very oppressive uh, uh, circumstances in their own country. Question number four, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government uh, what funding it provides to encourage young people to participate in art, drama and music in South Lanarkshire. Uh, through, through the Scottish Government's Youth Music Initiative and Cash Back for Creativity, we are providing opportunities for young people in this area. Um, there was uh, over £400,000 of funding um, in, from the YMI in 2017-18, uh, supporting seven high-quality music-making projects and also ensuring every primary school in South Lanarkshire is offered a year of free music tuition. That engagement has reached 6,800 uh, 6, young people and uh, specifically um, Yale Music, based in South Lanarkshire, is an example of how we can fund projects that are developed uh, locally. Uh, £24,000 of support for Gale Music developed a new regional folk music academies and ensembles um, that are dedicated to collecting and learning and sharing of traditional music. James Kelly. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Art, drama and music are important public services. Therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary support the use of increased taxation to provide greater support to public services. Cabinet Secretary. Well, in terms of um, those issues, I think there are debates about to commence. There are engagements and a process of dialogue. I, I think that's the responsibility of the Finance Secretary in particular. But I can say that we are using the funds that we have available to help protect public services and in particular culture and despite the fact that culture is not a statutory responsibility of local government over recent years the spend on culture has been protected by local government but a lot of the responsibility that he talks about are for local government we can try and fund that and support that as we do for our different agencies but I'm particularly pleased that in South Lanarkshire young people are benefiting for the current funds that we have available but there is time for the debates that he wants to have. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that access to art, drama, music, and may I just throw in sport as well, allows the opportunity for participation, integration, and activity, all of which Sam H suggests will help to tackle poor mental health? And will the Cabinet Secretary therefore commit to collaborating with the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and the Preventative Health uh, Agenda to ensure that her portfolio spend and the health spend reflects this approach? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member is absolutely right. I think the sense of health and well-being that uh, can be achieved through all these um, areas is something that I feel very strongly about. He'll be pleased to know that in terms of our current debate on the culture strategy for Scotland, which is about embedding and having relationships on health and justice and education through uh, the medium of, of, of culture, that precise point was a, a key part of our discussions in Paisley um, yesterday afternoon as part of our consultation. I already work with the Health Secretary, but I think, as he, he knows, we all can do more to make sure that that is embedded because that sense of health and well-being can seriously be reinforced for uh, a real transformation in people's lives through the medium of art, music, drama and indeed sport. Question number five, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what role sport has in attracting tourism to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. A uh, very important role and Scotland has a, a strong reputation as the perfect stage for major events and we're proud to host a number of high profile events. 2014 Commonwealth Games welcomed visitors from across the world, um, an estimated 600,000 ticket buyers from outside Scotland. The World Gymnastic Championships were a great success in 2015, and just last month, 17,000 spectators enjoyed the World Badminton Championships in Glasgow. There are more than 200,000 tickets for next year's European Championships on sale, um, and a potential television audience of over uh, 1 million, um, sorry, 1 billion, I should correct myself, 1 billion will see what Scotland has to offer uh, from the streets of Glasgow and also three days of uh, road races, uh, stunning uh, Loch Lomond for the open water swimming and the renowned Glen Eagles for golf. Obviously, as the home of golf, golf tourism itself is worth £286 million annually and the Scottish Government supports events such as the Scottish Open, Ladies Scottish Open and the Open Championship. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, it, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. If I might focus on one aspect of it, the, the Barclay Review on Business Rates has called for rates relief to be removed from some of Scotland's golf courses that currently receive rates relief, including ones that attract tourists to Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, will be currently considering this option. Is the Cabinet Secretary concerned about the potential effects on tourism to Scotland if business rates are dramatically increased for some of these courses, which could lead to higher green fees and indeed closure of courses altogether. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is, is sitting next to me. He, he has responded in part to the Barclay Review uh, and also will be considering other aspects in relation to uh, golf. People come for the quality of our golf. Uh, high net, uh, high net uh, travellers come uh, to, uh, to, to participate in golf tourism. It has, as I said, £268 million in terms of um, the net value it provides. Uh, clearly, Barclay has uh, assessed this. The member himself can make representations himself, uh, but clearly, in terms of what we can have on offer, uh, we've got to drive forward that agenda for tourism. Uh, but I, I would think that he has to reflect on what the equity and the equity responses when Scotland has got challenges in business rates and what is fair and what is appropriate. Richard Lyle. Thank you, officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what value the Scottish Government places on Scotland hosting major sporting events and what impact this has had on the tourism industry and what other events do we have to look forward to in the coming years? Cabinet Secretary. Of time, I, I did reflect um, earlier on about the economic impact. Looking forward, we've got the European Championships, as I said, in 2018, and the World Junior Curling Championships in 2019, the Solheim Cup, and the European Indoor Athletics Championships. A lot of hard work goes into securing those bids, uh, those bids and those events, uh, but it has an impact on tourism as well. Joanne, question number six, Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the national tourism strategy will increase the number of visitors to Glasgow and attract investment. Yeah, uh, the industry-led national tourism strategy, uh, Tourism Scotland 2020, and the Glasgow Lives, Glasgow Tourism and Visitor Plan to 2023 are wholly aligned. They share ambitions for sustainable growth and showcasing Scotland and Glasgow. Uh, delivering sustainable growth in the tourism sector will be supported by all the different uh, government agencies that are involved and, of course, Glasgow Life. Um, and I already and would hope to have continuous discussions with Glasgow Life on the tourism aspects. John Lamond. Thank you. I'm sure the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary will want to join me in congratulating Glasgow City Council, local voluntary sector organisations and businesses who had the vision ambition over many years to establish Glasgow as a highly popular tourism destination. And I'm sure the, the Cabinet Secretary also recognised in particular the significant achievements in establishing Glasgow 
as a business conference venue and even more successfully, as she referred to, as a global competitor for international sporting events, as she said, most recently the World Bad Badminton Championships. What will the Scottish Government do to ensure that Glasgow is sufficiently resourced to continue with such ambition and vision? Will she recognise the particular role of Glasgow in delivering a, um, such a massive change given and also ensure that they are properly resourced given the impact of such tourism on the economy of Glasgow and in Scotland as a whole? Cabinet Secretary. Sh share her congratulations of all those involved in transforming Glasgow as a, a tourism offer. We referred to city breaks earlier, but indeed uh, the offer of Glasgow is very strong, particularly around events and indeed in business conferences. And Glasgow as a gateway to the rest of Scotland allows that strategic work that is not just about sort of the benefit of hotels in Glasgow. Now, a lot of what she's talking about in terms of support investment, yes, some will come from the Scottish Government, but also how we ensure and help um, encourage private investment, particularly in the head Hotel infrastructure in Glasgow will be very important to reap the rewards which I know Glasgow can have uh, in the years ahead. Thank you very much, and that concludes portfolio.